Welcome everybody. It's 631. We'll get started relatively on time. I'm Ann Burns. For those of you who we haven't met yet, the current president of the Portsmouth Historical Society. And I'm really excited tonight to welcome you to um, hear about a story, a story that somebody earlier said tonight we don't talk about probably enough, right? So this is Ranger John McNiff. He's with Roger Williams National Memorial. John is a Rhode Island native. He was raised in Warwick. He attended Rhode Island College and received his BA in history with a minor in anthropology in 1979. Let's date ourselves. Um, after studying archaeology in England, and I cannot believe how many anthropologists and archaeologists are in this room tonight. It's pretty amazing. Um, in England, he worked on numerous projects throughout New England, and he received his MA in anthropology, specializing in archaeology um, from SUNY Binghamton in 1990. In 1996, John began working with the National Park Service, and in 1997, he was stationed as a park ranger at the Roger Williams National Memorial on North Main Street in Providence. Um, John is a very gifted storyteller. His format is storytelling. And he's renowned as a leading specialist on the life and times of our state founder, Roger Williams. That's, that will be in for another time. And so without further ado, I'd like to introduce you to Ranger John McNiff, who will share with us the story of New England before the English. Hi, everybody. Hi. Can you all hear me? Hi. Excellent. The ones in the back are the ones that matter. If you can't hear me and you are here and they can hear you, there's something, there's something wrong. I spent a bunch of years around here as an archaeologist. Starting off, the first site that I excavated was in Seatonk, as a matter of fact, along the Wampanoag Trail. But I want to make it clear that tonight I am not telling the story of Native Americans. There are plenty of Native Americans that are around with all the different tribes that are around that are tribal historians that can come here and tell you their own story. That's not my job. My job is to take a look at the scientific evidence that we have and how we have interpreted it. Does that make sense? Okay. You want to know about the Narragansett, you want to know about the Poconocet, you want to know about the Nipmuc or the Massachusetts or anybody else, talk to them. They're the, they're the keepers of their own stories. Make sense? Okay. I was just reading today, and this is surprising. Um, in general, when I was learning archaeology, they always talked about the Native Americans coming across the land bridge from Asia in the Bering Strait about maybe 15,000 years ago. You all remember at some level learning about them coming across then? Okay, and the Clovis point was the, was the tool that all of them used, and it was spread across the continent, and they had moved in roughly a couple of thousand years from Alaska all the way down to Tierra del Fuego. That was the story for an awful long time. It's been updated just this year dramatically. Earlier this year at, I think it's Great Sands in National Park out west, they found footprints in the, in the, in the rock dated back to 22,000 years ago. Before that, there were other sites, there were some in Pennsylvania that claimed they had 17, maybe 18,000 year old tools and fireplaces, but it wasn't convincing for everybody. Here are human footprints. Not one set, but several people walking along in the sands together 22,000 years ago. I thought, wow, that's, that changes the way a lot of people think about things, doesn't it? Nope, it gets better. A Couple of months after that, further west, they found some bones and some tools dated to 33,000 years ago. That's another 10,000 years. That's what we were thinking the whole thing was. But there's another 10,000 years added to that. But it gets even better. It was an article in Smithsonian recently, very recently, that talked about mastodon bones that they found out in California. 133,000 years ago. 
133,000 years ago. Translate that over to Europe. Modern humans aren't even there yet. Europe is the realm of the Neanderthal, yet Native Americans are already here on this continent, 133,000 years ago. When the Native American people say they've been here since time immemorial, that's what it is. Now, what was this place where we are like? Well, let's go back to what they call the Pleistocene era, what the Ice Age, okay? Ice, here, from the ground that we have, up at least a mile, acting like a great big bulldozer coming down from the north, pushing everything in front of it, grinding down the mountains so that now they're hills. That great Appalachian mountain range were a lot bigger before the glaciers came through. Cape Cod, the islands, Long Island. You've all seen the bad snowstorm. And the plow comes along into the parking lot and misses the edge of the parking lot and digs up some of the gravel and leaves that snow pile at the end as a mixture of snow and dirt and gravel. And when May comes along, there's a big pile of snow and dirt, there's a big pile of dirt and gravel. That's Long Island, that's Martha's Vineyard in Nantucket, and that's Cape Cod. That's where the glacier here stopped. And the glacier retreated somewhere in between 20,000 years ago and about 17,000 years ago. Here, retreated, not all at once. It's not like some, somebody turned on a switch, the glacier melted, started going backwards. No, it was a slow process. Sometimes big chunks of the glacier would fall off in front of the glacier. And imagine a chunk of ice say the size of this building, falling a mile into the ground here. What would it do? Big depression. Big depression. You ever see the kettle hole ponds? That's what they are. Big chunks of ice have fallen off the front of the glacier, pounded down into the ground. Huge hole, fills up with water, and you've got the little kettle holes, as we call them. But the glacier retreats. And I do have to say, as soon as it's retreating, we believe that the Native Americans came along here because they have a story about Mashop, who was a giant from the north that came down with rocks and things in his apron and stumbled, and the apron opened and it formed the Elizabeth Island. If you're going to relate your own history to other people, a giant from the north with rocks and dirt in his apron stumbles and falls. That's literally what the glacier did. So there were people here relating stories about those times. This was a very different looking place too, going back then. You can imagine. Imagine it first being like an open tundra and dry land going out as far uh, further than Block Island almost out to the edge of the continental shelf. Dry land. This great Narragansett Bay that we, that's the central part of our state was a river valley. Portsmouth was a hilltop. All the islands are hilltops in that, in that. And the glaciers are retreating more and more. And all of this area is open land, a savanna, a tundra. It's cold, but there are people here. And there are animals to hunt. Mastodon were around here. You guys know what a mastodon is, right? It's a big elephant-like creature. There were different kinds of animals that live in here than there, were, than there are now. But think about caribou and bison. Herds of thousands of them traveling the landscape here. And people following and hunting them. As time went on, the glaciers retreat even more, and the environment changes again. It's not so cold anymore. The rivers start to be fuller that go down the center of Narragansett Bay. The shoreline comes in closer. 
so that Block Island is right at the edge of the shoreline. That's a hill right, right on the coast. Imagine the real estate values then. <laughs> Long Island Sound is dry land with Long Island on the other side of it. And there is some evidence that there were pieces of land that blocked the eastern end of Long Island Sound and the western end of Long Island Sound. So you've got a, this hump from the end of the glaciers and then a valley and then what we know as the coast of Connecticut. And there's some evidence that at some point as the glaciers are retreating, that land that's at the end of Long Island failed and the ocean rushed in and flooded all of Long Island Sound. Can you imagine what that would have been like? What was a valley and all of a sudden you've got the ocean rushing in and filling it up. Might explain Connecticut today. <laughs> but it took until about 5,000 years ago for an environment similar to what we have here to exist. Block Island is set off the coast now. Martha's Vineyard and Nantucket are off the coast, separated from the mainland. Long Island is separated from the mainland. Narragansett Bay is a full bay. But the environment's still a little bit different, but it's more similar to what we have now. 5,000 years ago, people were utilizing the landscape here in a way that would be familiar to all of us. There's deer. There's bear, there's moose, there's all other kinds of animals all around here. And people are setting up their families, clans, groups of people, whatever, are setting up their own territories and living in them, cooperating with each other, talking to each other. It's a broad network where people are traveling across this landscape. It's 5,000 years ago. In Providence, you all familiar with Providence? You guys know where the State House is? Yeah. Okay. You know where Kennedy Plaza is from the State House? Okay. First Baptist Church? No. Okay. And the Coca Cola Bottling Company? Yeah. There was a big saltwater cove there. The Mashasic River comes down from the north, the Winasquatucket comes in from the, from the west, and then it turns into the Providence River and opens out into Narragansett Bay. But this area in between Kennedy Plaza and the State House, from the First Baptist Church almost all the way over to the Coca-Cola Bottling Company, almost into Oneyville, that was the Great Salt Cove, where the 610 connector goes around the base of Federal Hill. That was one of the shores. Great bluffs going up to a flat land on top. The same thing around the State House, big sandy bluffs going up to a nice flat plateau. And in that space, this is from archaeology that was done when they were changing over the rail yards through there. It's called the Cove Lands Project. There were clams, quahogs, oysters, lobsters, crabs. All of them were being harvested. One thing about oysters, clams and quahogs, they move around. Oysters stay in one place. They attach themselves to rocks and things like that. So where the skating rink is in Kennedy Plaza and also where Close to where Nordstrom's is on the mall with huge oyster banks with oysters about a foot across. Yeah. The crabs, ducks and geese now were using this as a stop on their way south and on their way back north. The great northeast flyway, this great salt water cove was a resource for them to stop and gather some energy and strength, reorganize and head on down south. It became a gathering spot for all the different tribes. If you look at a modern map, Route 1 goes from Boston all the way to Manhattan. Goes, that's north and south Main Street. Route 6 goes from the tip of the Cape right into Providence and then goes to the southwest. Route 44 goes from Plymouth right to where Providence is and then goes due west. That's Smith Street. They're all Native American highways. I'm not going to say trails. They weren't trails. They were highways. They were used for thousands of years for people traveling around through this area. When people say trails, they automatically make it diminutive. These were highways where for thousands of years, lots of people moved 
They used the ocean, they used the rivers, but they also used the land. Moving all along Route 1, the Great North-South Trail, there were other roads going up into central Massachusetts. There was a network of roads all through this area that once the English ended up coming here, they said, well, this is going where we want to go. We'll just use this. If you take a look, if you, if you ever travel down the west side of the bay and follow Route 1, you notice it branches off into Route 1A. Well, route 1A is the old route. Route 1 is what they straightened it out for for automobiles. So you don't have to make all the twists and turns. You follow these roads, and they go to the easiest way to get from point A to point B. It starts, the beauty of it, it starts right in Providence. If you've ever gone across the Crawford Street Bridge and the Turk Head bu Turk's Head Building is right in front of you, well, Ibasa Street goes around the Turk's Head Building. There used to be a hill there. So you're walking this path from Boston or from, or from the tip of the Cape, and you're coming in, and there's a hill going around it. That's what these roads did. That's why everybody complains about New England roads. <laughs> they really don't have a grid there. No, because the road system here isn't based on our idea of where we should go. It's based on where the roads are and going along. You'll see them out in the countryside where the road will go along parallel to a river and then cross it. Why? It's the easiest place to cross the river. It'll go along, along an area and go around the swamp. Okay, English roads, if you take a look at turnpikes anywhere around here, they're straight as an arrow, following the old Roman tradition. We're going to build a road from here to there, which means we're going this way. They build bridges, they build, you know, they raise the roadbeds up. It's much easier to go around these things. But these roads were in use for 5,000 years. So they're packed down, compact, sturdy roads that the English then utilized once they got here. There was a huge change in how people lived around here about a little bit more than a thousand years ago, possibly as early as 1500 years ago. And it's something that came across the entire continent from Mexico up to here. Started in Mexico 2,000, 2,500, maybe 3,000 years ago. It's called maize agriculture. Italian food is known for what? Huh? What, what, what? What goes with the pasta? Though? What kind of gravy? Tomato. Tomato is not native to Europe. Tomato was developed over here by the Native Americans. German food. If you want to be a beautiful German dessert, what do you think about? Okay. German chocolate. German chocolate. Chocolate is not from Europe. Chocolate is from over here. When you think about Irish food, what's the one staple that goes with it? Potatoes. Potatoes. Not from Ireland. Again, from over here. Potatoes were the first crop designed to be freeze-dried. They would harvest them, mash them, leave them on the rocks in the Andes, and the cold, dry weather would freeze-dry the potatoes. So then you could pile them up, store them, and they last an awful long time. The first product to be freeze-dried, to be designed to be freeze-dried, wasn't done by European scientists, wasn't done by American scientists, it was done by Native Americans. And then there's maize. Teosinte, about 3,000 years ago in Mexico, was a type of grass. And they developed it and bred it to get the kind of plant that we recognize today as corn or maize. And with that, it started spreading because it grows in an amazing number of different environments. It's technically a desert plant, but you can grow it here. You can grow it all the way up. Basically, I've seen it being grown north of, north of Gloucester, but Gloucester is about the extent that the kind of agriculture that they were doing could be done. Okay? Agriculture. That changes everything, again. People that had been a little bit more mobile are now settling down into areas, okay? But along with that, this agriculture is not just simply growing one plant and that's it. There are three plants that they grew together. 
corn, beans, and squash. And each family would take about an acre of land, which would create a surplus for a family of six to eight people, one acre of land. For the English, with single crops in each acre, it would take six to eight acres for a family of six. Native Americans had a way of planting the corn, beans, and squash together in that acre of land to create a food surplus. They would make mounds of dirt all throughout that acre and plant the corn, beans, and squash together on the hills. Corn grows up. The beans grow up the corn stalk. The squash spreads out and covers the ground so the sun doesn't dry out the ground and so you don't have to weed it so much. All three plants work together. When you take a chemical analysis of it, corn and squash take nitrogen out of the soil, beans put nitrogen in. All three plants are cooperating for their, for their mutual benefit. And when you take corn, beans, and squash and add a little bit of meat and a little bit of fish, you get a perfectly balanced diet. The archaeological remains finding Native Americans from during this, arch, during this agricultural period Native American men are six foot one, six foot two, six foot three. Many of the women are almost six feet tall. Really well nourished people around here. The corn, beans, and squash, a wonderful growing season. But the real key to this area, New England, is the mixture of coastal resources and inland resources. If you take Connecticut, it's got a straight, flat coastline with rivers that go in perpendicular to the coast, correct? You can all visualize that. You get to Rhode Island, and you have little inlets and coves and streams and rivers and inlets and coves, and then you have Narragansett Bay, 400, 420 miles of coastline coming inland, and inside of that, there's little coves and inlets and estuaries. And then you go further east as you get out towards the Cape, New Bedford, Fall River, it continues all the way up to Gloucester. What does that give you? Ocean resources and inland resources, literally right next to each other. If you've ever taken a look at the way the human brain is with all the convolutions, it's so you can get more stuff in, a, in, in the compact space. That's what's happening here. You've got an awful lot of stuff next to each other, which means they don't have to move around so much. When the English did get here, they mentioned that they, the Native Americans would live along the coast during the summer and have their fields near the coast and then move inland during the winter. Okay. Oh, there's one thing I didn't mention about the, uh, the Great Salt Cove and the resources that were there. You ever heard of the fish called salmon? <laughs> Anybody like it? Okay. You've all seen the films of the grizzly bears out west diving headfirst into the river or sitting on top of the waterfall and looking, looking, looking. And they get a nice 25 pound Chinook or sockeye salmon, right? And wow, that's a big fish for the grizzly bear. Mm. Remember my description of the cove. You have the Mashasic River coming down from the north and the Winoscotucket River coming in from the west. Two freshwater rivers go to the cove. Then it funnels down into one, the Providence River, as it goes through the middle of Providence and down to Narragansett Bay. So when the salmon are running, you've got on the Providence River, two freshwater rivers worth of salmon coming upstream. And right where the Crawford Street Bridge is and the Turk's Head building, there was a ford going across the river there where at low tide you could walk across. At low tide, you could walk across, which means the salmon can't get past it. You could go down there, and the English described picking up the salmon, and throwing them up on shore. And not just the 20, 25 pound Chinook or sockeye salmon. These are North Atlantic salmon. They make that trip upstream and then back out to the ocean four or five times in their lifetime. 50, 60, 70 pounds a piece. Smoke them, and you've got food to preserve all year. Corn, beans, squash, they all preserve ex exceedingly well in these environments. The Native Americans would dig big pits in the ground, line them with baskets, and put the dried corn in there or the dried pumpkin, 
or the dried beans in these pits. Cover them up and then cover them with dirt, <coughs> six, seven foot deep in the ground. If you have a cellar and you've been there during the summer, you know how much cooler it is. It's cool storage. Salmon, oysters. Oysters aren't moving. The clams may be hard, hard to find, but the oysters aren't moving. The salmon you can go and pick up with your hands. If the crops get hit by a hurricane in August or early September, you still get the smoked salmon. You still get oysters. You probably still have other plants around. You've got the berry bushes, strawberries, raspberries, blueberries, all of those things. Oak. Hickory, chestnuts, walnuts, all of these things throughout this, this landscape here because one of the things that happened that the Native Americans did to manipulate the environment was to set fire to the woods every year. This rapid fire, because it's moving fast, gets rid of the underbrush, gets rid of ticks, gets rid of fleas, gets rid of the small saplings, and leaves behind the hardwoods, oak, hickory, chestnut, walnut trees, so much so that when the English did come, they said these trees, three grown men with their arms outstretched, could barely get around the base of them. If you look at the oldest houses in New England, you see some of the chestnut beams used for framing. If you try to drive a nail into, into them now, they're hard as a rock and you'll bend the nail. But even at that, they're still 16 inches square which means if you're going to be bending a nail trying to pound it in there, they were much bigger before they've shrunk down and hardened. The big change when the estuary started forming around here was that the Native Americans started manipulating the environment. That's what we've got the evidence for. These yearly fires changing what's left here. Because the first thing that comes back after these fires, after the fleas and ticks are destroyed, after the poisonous plants are destroyed, after the, the plants that don't do anything for you are destroyed, the first things to come back are the grasses and the berry bushes. Grasses, berry bushes, hardwood trees that produce nuts. Open spaces between the trees. When Verrazano came here in 1524, he said, you could take an army and march it through the thickest woods that they have, and nobody will miss a step. So think of it more like an open parkland than any of the kinds of woods that you see around here now. And that's the perfect environment for deer and for bear. They manipulated the environment for their benefit. Corn was manipulated for their benefit. Beans were manipulated for their benefit. Squashes were manipulated to so many different kinds of plants. Chocolate, tomatoes, things that we take for granted on a day-to-day -day basis were all created over here before any Europeans ever came. Potatoes. I come from an Irish background. I know what potatoes mean. <laughs> This world that's now Rhode Island was occupied for thousands and thousands of years by people that knew this place, breathed this place. This place was part of them. Their parents, their grandparents, their ancestors are all here. 99% of us here come from somewhere else at some point. Okay? How many have ever gone home, home to where the family's from? It's moving, isn't it? There's something of us that's still there. This place, there's too many histories out there that, tur that turn Native Americans into caricatures. They're people that by the time the Europeans were here and long before that they had a complex government system. Complex government system complex belief system, were manipulating the environment to their benefit, had manipulated plants in ways that Europeans hadn't even thought of doing. If you go down to Central America, one of the largest cities in the world with running water and flush toilets was in the early 1500s. It's the capital of the Aztec Empire. 
is far bigger than almost anything, anything in Europe. This was a lot different. New England or North America was a lot different than most people ever expect. And with the most recent discoveries, finding that people have been here manipulating their environment, taking animals, 133,000 years? It's amazing. But this was the environment that Europeans came into. Exactly when? Good guess. Everybody has their favorite. The Irish like to have St. Brendan coming over here in about seven or 800. Documentation for Europeans coming over here and archeological finds have the Vikings about a thousand years ago. Up in Newfoundland, at Lanso Meadows, there's one bit of evidence that's really neat that the Vikings probably came here to Rhode Island, and it's not a carved stone. It's nothing in Rhode Island. It's some coal that was found in Greenland at a Viking settlement. And the type of coal is the type that you get here in Rhode Island. Okay? So Europeans are coming over for a thousand years, then they stop. Then they start coming over again. Well, no, they didn't stop. Portuguese, vast fishermen are coming across this ocean because that big thing called Cape Cod has codfish. That's why it gets its name. Some of the early explorers' boats would get stuck in schools of codfish. Have you ever been to the Massachusetts State House? Above the speaker's chair, there's an eight foot long codfish. That's not an exaggeration, that's not a symbol, that's a model after a real fish. These fish were so thick that they would stop a boat like the Mayflower off of Cape Cod. Basque and Portuguese fishermen were coming over here to get codfish in the 1300s. They'd dry them, salt them here, and bring them back to Portugal. So much so that in 1495, they were driving down the prices of the locally caught codfish. So they banned the importation of codfish from the New World. 1495. There's a date around there that's really important to a lot of people. What is that date? What, did, what supposedly happened in 1492? Columbus discovered the New World. The people have been coming over here for a couple hundred years before that. Not in huge numbers. But coming over here, having a fishing village, staying on the coast, and then going home. There are also whaling villages from the 12 and 1300s that have been found along the coast of Maine. The first heavily documented Europeans coming over here, Giovanni de Verrazzano, as I mentioned, 1524. He sailed into the middle part of the country around the mid-Atlantic states and sailed up the coast. Didn't much like most of the people he was running into as he came along the coast. But when he sailed into Narragansett Bay, it was like, well, the way he describes it, it's like the heavens opened up, the angels started singing, the trumpets and the dolphins were, I mean, it was, he describes the people as being the most beautiful and the most friendly that he has met on the entire voyage, the most hospitable, that they were curious, and that he stayed in Narragansett Bay for two weeks that they were far taller than the Europeans, but they were wonderful people. He just, I mean, the description is just glowing of Narragansett Bay. He calls it refugio, the refuge. And then other people are still coming across back and forth, back and forth. That Verrazzano was an Italian that was sailing for the King of France and, you know, it gets confusing after a while. But the Cabot brothers and um, the Corte Real brothers and they're all people trying, trying to come across the ocean and a lot of people make a point of the ones that didn't go back. Well, sailing across the Atlantic Ocean in the 15 and 1600s was really, really dangerous. How many people are sailors? Okay. Have you been out beyond the bay on a stormy t in a stormy time? It's nasty, and that's on a modern boat. If you've seen the Mayflower, okay, you've got a sailboat, okay? It's, it sails better than it looks because um, 
I can't remember the name of the ship, but one of the ships that's down at Jamestown, they had a reproduction that they were sending, that they built up in Maine, and they were bringing it down. It stopped in Newport, I think, in, in 2007. Stayed for about a week in Newport, and I got to talk to the sailors on board. And the naval engineers that had told them about, that had helped them with the design on it said she's going to wallow in the water like a, you know and just be floating back and forth because she's very very broad at the waterline, very stubby, okay, and has a high stern and a high forecastle, but the high stern and the high forecastle taper up as they go up. And they said she's not going to sail very well. She's only going to get about four or five knots. She's going to be horrible in any sort of really bad wind. And then I talked to the sailors who had sailed her down from Maine into Newport. They said, she's beautiful. She doesn't wallow in the water. She doesn't pitch in yaw. She sits on the water like a duck. And when the wind blows, the high forecastle and the high stern act like a weather vane, turning her into the wind. So she'll be riding over the waves the way a duck would. And it, she makes more than four or five knots. She makes about 12. But it's a ship that's made out of wood that has to have all the seams sealed and caulked. Okay? And the stress on the boat from the sails stretching the masts can actually make the seams come apart. And if it's not perfectly secure, if it's not a new boat, you can't depend on the planking because shipworms can chew through that the way termites chew, chew through an old house. And that stress from the mast pulling and pulling and pulling can, again, pop those seams. And if the planks aren't right, everything can fall apart. Up to 20% of the European ships that left Europe coming over here just disappeared. 20%. If we had a space program that 20% of the things we launched just disappeared, <laughs> would there be any sort of a space program? No, but they kept going. Two months to get across that ocean for the Europeans to get over here. What were you doing two months ago? This is October, September, August. We were sweating. Okay. Think about it. Middle of August. From the middle of August to now, picture everything you've had to drink. Picture everything you've had to eat. Put it all into wooden barrels. The food has to be dried, smoked, or salted. Put it in the wooden barrels and put it out on the ship. Everything you've had to drink goes into wooden barrels, and that goes in the bottom of the ship. Take maybe half of this space and put 100 people in it for two months. There's one bathroom with a bucket over there. How many people have ever been seasick? Is it fun? No. Most of the people coming across are landlubbers, so they would at least, for part of the trip, be seasick. Find your own bucket. There's, you could maybe put up a partition in between your family and the next, but there's a hundred in that space, a hundred people, crowded. Nobody takes a bath for the two months because fresh water is precious. You're wearing wool and linen clothes. If you've spent time on board a ship, what happens to your clothes when you're on board ship? They get damp or wet, don't they? You ever smell wet wool? <laughs> Top that off with somebody that hasn't bathed in a month. Okay, There's a year, universal revulsion to the smell of stepping on board ships in those days. Okay, Everybody thinks, well, nobody took baths over in Europe. Of course they did. They washed almost every day. They put a clean shirt on every other day. Okay, They had a fire in the house. This is something I learned as a reenactor that the smoke from a fire, if you hang your clothes near it, how do you preserve hams? Smoke them. What does that do? It kills all the bacteria and things like that that might destroy it, dries them out a little bit. You hang your clothes near a fire or even be near the fire and they get smoky. It's like smoking your clothes. Found that out the hard way as a reenactor. It gives a different sense of what's going on. That's why it makes more sense when you have these people writing about getting on board these ships and just being absolutely repulsed by the smell because guess what's going on on those ships? There's no fire. Because how do you heat a wooden ship? You don't. That's why pass passage across the ocean. On a nice hot August day, you set out, getting over here, 
now? It's a little bit chilly. Suppose you set out in September or the beginning of this month. You'd be getting over here in winter. Have we had any bad weather in the last couple of months? On land, it's not too bad. You might knock down a tree branch or two, rattle the windows. Out on the ocean, it literally picks the ocean up. It becomes waves. The way a cat plays with a mouse, that boat is bounced around. The waves are crashing over the boat. You're getting soaking wet. And then all that food that you've stored down at the bottom of the boat gets soaking wet. <coughs> what happens to dried, salted, or smoked food if it gets wet and sits there for a month? moldy at best. And the sea biscuits, the biscuits that are specially made for sailors to eat, okay, even when they're made right, they get little weevils in them, okay? So your food is rotten. You're feeling rotten because you're seasick and everything smells bad. You're cramped on board, and that's only after the first month. You got another month to go. And remember, 20% of these ships don't make it at all and you're leaving everything you've ever known behind. That's what it's like just to get across the ocean. People didn't do it just for fun. But the Europeans, first the Spanish going to Central and South America, Portuguese, oh, I, I was mentioning the codfish. The codfish is what allowed the Portuguese to be the first long distance explorers. The bacalhau, salted card, codfish allowed them to take food that would last a long time, Prince Henry the Navigator and all that, going around Africa to the Far East. That codfish allowed them to do that. The Spanish saw what was going on, and they had, Christopher, they had that Christopher Columbus guy, and he happened to bring back gold from the New World, which, <sighs> treasure is Sierra Madre. Everybody gets into a fever over gold, and that's what happened with Europe. The Spanish came over here with the same people, the same soldiers that had just reconquered all of Spain, the conquistadors. They had just driven, driven the Moors out of Spain. They were looking, for, and the, the crown was looking for a place to put these soldiers. What do you do with them now? They're all fighters. They all live a rough life. Well, send them where Columbus went. So they come over to the New World. They bring back on just one of those Spanish galleons, they're bringing back more gold than it had been in circulation of all of Europe beforehand. So Spain is getting rich. All the other countries in Europe say, Spain's getting rich. We can do that too. So they all try different explorations over here. And this has a tremendous impact on the people that are already living here. When the English, the Dutch, the French, the Spanish all start to come over here, they come over in a scale Unlike the earlier fishermen, one boat, fishing village, go home. One boat, whaling village, go home. They're coming over here on a huge scale. More and more fishermen, more and more explorers, if you would. And what they do bring with them is disease. And one of the most impactful ones to this area came in between 1616 and 1619. Some sort of a disease, we're not sure what. Every, a lot of people want to say smallpox, but smallpox was as virulent to the English as it would have been to anybody else and would have gotten everybody sick on board the ship. It's something along the lines of influenza or something like that that would spread quickly and could be absolutely fatal to a population that had not been exposed to it before. In between 1616 and 1619, from Gloucester all the way down to the Cape and coming over almost, almost to the Providence area. And between 60 and 90% of the Native American population was wiped out by this disease, this plague that swept through there. 60 to 90%. Well, there must have been rats on the ship. Could have been rats on the ship. Could have, it could have been the, the symptoms that are mentioned don't match that. No. Um, there were other plagues that followed up. They did have episodes of smallpox later. But this one was something that moved extremely quickly, literally to the point where there were bodies lying out in the woods. What happens when 60 to 90% of any group is killed off, any political entity, any cultural entity? What would happen if it happened in Portsmouth? 
people would leave. What else? If there were people, would rush in. If there were people around. Anarchy. I mean, it's re literally region wide. Hmm? Anarchy. Anarchy is one. Okay. New people rushing in is a possibility if there's a group nearby that hasn't been affected. Anarchy. You're going to stop at the stoplight? Okay. No. And all the rules start to break down. All the structure starts to break down. Everything you've, you've been familiar with with your whole life starts to break down. Yes? And that's when the pilgrims showed up. 1620. Into a place that was in total, total <coughs> chaos. Because every, at where they landed, everybody had been killed by this disease. Everybody at the place called Patuxa had been killed. There were some other people around the area, but think about, from the English point of view, it was a blessing that God had cleared the land for them. Not so much for the people who had been here for 133,000 years, was it? <coughs> I'm done. Thank you, folks. <laughs> Anybody have any questions? Yes, sir. So, what <coughs> do you guess the population would have been before the 690 percent died? Of which area? Well, let's just say uh, New England. New England. That's huge. Um, I'm not even going to guess at that. I'll give you. I'll give you an estimate for what I think West Bay, Rhode Island would be, in the neighborhood of 50,000 people. Okay, because when John Smith sails along the coast, he talked about a hundred plus canoes coming out to greet him. And these got 40 people in them, in each one of these. Think about a canoe the, a canoe the size of a school bus with 40 people in it. And that's not everybody in the community, that's the adult males. And a hundred of them is how many people? That's 4,000, so add, that's 4,000 males from one community coming out to greet him near Boston. There's a lot of people living around here. It's well populated because there's an awful lot of food that doesn't depend on just one aspect of life. There's agriculture, there's hunting and fishing, all of this in one small area, so there's really an abundance of food. That's what the Europeans lived off, that abundance. Yes, sir. Did you find the Narragansetts didn't suffer much, or not suffer as much? Did they just, did they just start with more people? No. Um, the plague didn't get to them. This first one in 1616 to 1619, which says to me that, remember, what, remember when I said that during the summers they'd be on the coast farming and then in the winters move into sheltered valleys? Sounds like whatever it was was coming over at the beginning of winter when they're moving into the sheltered valleys rather than going on trade trips, moving through different territories. So it was one of those things that was, it was being confined into a small area by people going, uh, doing pretty much what they did for the last two years around here. Um, there, as I mentioned, there were other plagues that came through New England within a few years and everybody gets affected by it. Yes, sir. Is there any evidence of the Chinese moving, being here I have not seen any. I have not seen any any significant evidence of Chinese coming up here. Um, a lot of people mention things that might be or might not be, but the Chinese at that point that they were exploring, they were a pretty sophisticated lot. They didn't just use a rock with a hole in it as an anchor. They had they had a significant technology. And if you've been, ever been to a place where any group of people have gone through, you'll find not the big things that they left behind, but you'll find the detrius. You'll find a button that fell off. You'll find the other, the other things like that. And you just don't get it. It's just not there. So I'm, I'm not convinced that they, so they came up no this way. there's no carbon uh, identification no. or evidence? No, not for the Chinese. A lot of other people coming through here. Um, there's a lot of questionable things. You know, there's the, the stone monuments further north. Who built them? Why, why were they built? And you ask 10 people and you get 10 different explanations for them. Um, I'm very much along the lines of thinking the simplest answer is the best. 
Native Americans had a complex culture, a complex politics, and in all honesty, astronomy and astro astronomy was, they had a complex system of astronomy around here too. In Roger Williams' book, The Key to the Language of America, he mentions that the Narragansett have numbers that go up to 100,000. That bothered me for a long time, because what are they counting that matters in between 99,520 and 99,525? Because there are Native Americans in, Se in South America that have three numbers, one, two, and many. And it bothered me for a long time because things of that volume that you're counting, usually anybody else would go into bushel baskets or, you know, or basket loads or things like that, and you wouldn't be measuring individual grains of corn. There would be no purpose to it. There was a convention of mathematicians in Providence, and I brought it up. You know, they math numbers, mathematicians, might as well see what they say. And this guy told me that almost universally when a culture has number sets that high, they're dealing with astronomy. And then the next chapter in Roger's book is about the constellations and the stars in the sky. That it was so similar to what, they, that what Roger was used to over back in Europe. The same kind, they're marking the constellations and the stars in the sky. And about a month after that, I went out to the Plymouth Patuxet Museum, and in one of the native Weetus there, they're like a dome tent. They're about 15 feet across, ma made in a dome, dome with saplings that are stuck into the ground in a grid pattern that they attach the coverings to. There's a smoke hole in the top and a little tiny fire in the middle just to keep it nice and warm. Well, this was a day pretty much like, to, not today, but like one of the colder days we've had in the last few days. It was cold, it was damp, the fire was there, but it was smoky. The sun was out. The smoke and the sunbeam came in just to one of the corners of the grid. And I'm thinking, grid, numbers, stars, constellations, it's all laid out right there. It's easy enough to keep track of if you've got a number set. Thank you.